Amen. So today we're going to start a new series, which is Awaken, and we're excited. And today we're going to be talking about awakening your faith. And so please join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord Jesus Christ, even now in the beginning of the year, um, there's people that have, uh, have heard or have gone through um, really difficult ordeals. I pray that you will continue to lift them up, and we lift them up in prayer. Our sister Tabitha, we pray for her. Our brother Jonathan, we pray for him. And anyone else, Lord God, we don't know everyone's story, but I'm so glad you know our story. You know what we are facing. You know what we're dealing with. You know what the first thought that came into our mind when we woke up this morning? I'm praying that your first thought was a, a, a thought of confidence and hope in our God and not of despair and hopelessness. And if you're in despair and if you've come to the right place, because I believe the Lord is speaking today, even through the worship and everything, and was talking about it's time to awaken our faith. And so we trust in you to use your servant for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his faithfulness? Hallelujah. Amen. Dave, is that um, song available on, 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 okay, so on social media, just go on, on social media platforms or just go in any streaming service and get that song? I know I'm getting it. How many are you getting it? Praise the Lord. Amen. Hey, praise the Lord. Oh, God. Why haven't you answered my prayers? I'm sure many of us have struggled with this question. By a show of hands, how many of you have struggled with, this, with that question? Now, in all reality is that, you know, sometimes life, uh, we find ourselves in very difficult circumstances and situations. I like to say it this way. Sometimes life can get really messy. And when life is really messy, many of us, desire for God, a godly intervention, so we call on God. And it's great when God answers your prayers right away. Isn't that great? I mean, how many of you could say that God, you prayed and, and instantaneously or really quickly God answered your prayers? And, and I know some of, sometimes we think God doesn't do it that way, but there are times... I could testify there were times in the little things and the big things where God has, you know, I prayed and instantaneously God has moved. But there's other times when we give God a request and there seems to be no response to our petition. So how many of you struggle once again with the reality of unanswered prayers? How many of you are struggling today with the reality of unanswered prayers in your life? Come on, lift up your hands and put it on in the chat because we want. It's okay. You can be honest. Sometimes we pray and there seems to be no kind of response, and so you wonder why. And the wonderful thing about the Bible, the Bible gives us instructions and it tells us many different reasons why God doesn't answer our prayers. Sometimes it's simply sin in the way that's blocking us from getting to God. But I'm not going to focus on that today. What I want to focus on one thing as we start our new series, I want to focus on that God sometimes does not answer our prayers because of our faith. What is faith? Faith is heavenly currency that allows God to move on our behalf. It's heavenly currency. You know, a lot of times now you go to the store and uh, what, what do we do now? We go this. Beep. Beep. Nobody uses cash anymore, right? People look at you for cash. You got cash. What's cash? You know, I don't know what that is. But faith is the heavenly currency that God, that we, that God allows us to use to move the heavens. Because sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations where we need a supernatural intervention, something that God can only do because we're helpless on our own. We, well, we run out of resources, but there are times where God is able to move in. How do we get a hold of that? By getting a withdrawal from heaven with our spiritual ATM machine which is our faith. Amen? So if you've been in church culture for a while, you probably heard a couple of things about faith and, and Christianity in terms of our relationship with God. First thing about it is that God gives us faith. I'm going to give you a couple of verses just to set the foundation, and then I'm going to go. Romans 12, 3, it says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of yourself better than you really are. But be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Look at this. Measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. 
God has given you faith. Turn to someone right now and say, God has given you faith. Each and every one of us has a faith. That is the faith that we have to believe in him as Lord and Savior and accept him to our heart. So we all have a different measure of faith. So someone says, I don't have any faith. That's not true because in all reality, God has given each and every one of us faith. So you have faith, some, some, some measure of faith. The second thing is that we are saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8. But it's by grace that you have been saved. What? Through faith. This is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. So we are saved by faith. Many of us today can sing the song of redemption. Many of us can testify of the goodness of God and being forgiven simply because we put our heart. We weren't there in Calvary more than 2,000 years ago. We never saw his death on the cross. We never saw his resurrection. But how many of us believe in today that Jesus is alive and well and he resurrected and he died for our sins? By faith, by faith, by faith, it is not what feelings, but it's all by faith. Thirdly, it says, we please God with our faith. Many of us know this scripture verse, Hebrews eleven six, 6, and without faith is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith is not told. In other words, God says, and he gives us each and every measure of faith, but he said, if you're not using it, So many of us put it aside, and and sometimes it's easier to live life without faith. Because I don't need, if I have a good bank account, you know, then I don't need faith. If everything is going well in my life, I don't need faith. If I'm completely healthy, healthy, I don't need faith. But faith is sometimes, we have to turn to God and say, God, I can't do it. And we humble ourselves and we say, God, I need a godly intervention. I need you to come in and do what only you can do. I need you to move and work on my behalf. So many of us know sometimes in church when we have heard, you know, we talk about faith. And many times God is not answering your prayers because your faith is either weak or small. How many of you have heard that? Your faith is either weak or small. You come and petition and someone, you know, who's very spiritual in the Lord. <laughs> and they say, well, brother, you know, your faith is, is weak or it's small. I, I remember years ago and, and, you know, those name it and claim it people and, and you know what I'm saying. And, and it was always wrestling with them. My friends, they were really into it. And every time there was a convention and every time there was, they were doing something downtown in the city, they would go and it was always, Yo, you got to have more faith. You got to have more faith. How do I get more faith? Give me a thousand dollars. That's more faith. That's not more faith. That's a scam. I said, wait a minute. So is it? Is that true? Is it true that we need more faith? I would suggest to you, look, it's not the size of your faith that gets your prayers answered, but the size of your God. How many can say amen to that? That's right. That'll preach. That'll preach. That'll preach. And you can leave with that. It's, and so we're going to see this. And in, in, in when Jesus had an encounter with this man who was struggling with his faith. And can we be honest with one another, even online? You home, so you could just raise your hand. And... <laughs> How many of us truly are struggling with our faith today? Oh, amen. Come on. Man, and each and every one of us. So let's read in the text and see what God is saying in the Book of Matthew, Matthew 17. I'm going to read six verses so those who have short attention spans. Pay attention. All right. (laughs) When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus responded, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, you have little, you have faith as small as a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, Move from here and there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. 
Now, just by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with this story, right? I have this narrative, right? Most of us have heard this time and time again. And so I went in, I said, oh God, you're giving me this familiar scripture. Give me something new, something that I can bring to the table, something. So let's break it down and before we can figure out what God is, wants us to know today. The first thing is that this account of this encounter with Jesus is found two places. It's found in the book of Matthew and it's also found in the book of Mark. Mark gives us more details. Matthew is a little bit shorter, so I said, let me concentrate on the, on the shorter one. But, but the book of Mark gives us a lot of details. A couple of things that we are known if you compare Matthew, if you take Matthew and Mark together, you see a couple of things. There was a man who had a son that was demon possessed. Now, in the book of Mark, it tells us that he was, a, he was since childhood. Imagine, since childhood, his son was demon possessed. It also tells us in Mark that the, the demon would throw him in the ground, causing him to, to foam with the mouth and to gnash his teeth. It also tells us that every once in a while, the boy would get suicidal tendencies and he would throw himself in the water and he would throw himself in the fire. And so we see this thing. So imagine the pain. Those of you who are parents, imagine the pain to see your child your child who you love in this predicament. Now, how many of you would do, move, do anything for your children? Yes. Come on, all of you, right? Most of you. <laughs> <laughs> My mom has passed away. She wouldn't, but everyone. <laughs> God rest his soul. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> But, but, you know, it's nice to say, yeah, I'll do everything for my kid. But make sure you do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, and then, so this man was in an unmovable situation. And, I mean, and he attempted, I'm, I'm sure he did everything he could to get a solution for his son because he was desperate. He was hurting. He, was, he, he wanted his son. He said, Daddy, what's happening? What happened to me? Son, I want to get you help. I want to get you the help you need. And then eventually he heard about Jesus and the, and, and the disciples and how God was using their mighty to deliver. He says, man, I got to get to them. I got to get to these disciples. So he brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples. Oh, it's going to be okay. Man, how many of us have gone to church? Ooh, this is going to be it. This is going to be the sermon. This is, man, that I got prayed over. I, I, they spilled so much oil on me. Man, I, I just, I felt so, I felt so greasy. I, I felt the anointing. I felt the greasy anointing, hallelujah. <laughs> Thinking that, you know, and how many of us have been in a situation where you thought that it was going to change? You thought it was going to get better, but it only got worse. So imagine how this man must have felt when the, he went to the disciples. And it tells us uh, uh, that, that, that he went to the disciples, but they could not heal them. They couldn't do anything for this man. Look at verse 16. I brought him to your disciples. They could not heal him. So this man doing the right thing, going to his disciples, and you would think that his faith would be strengthened, but it was crushed. I mean, come on. It's something, that's like you asking a pastor to pray for you, and it gets worse. God don't even answer the pastor prayers. I don't know about, I don't know about harvest. Maybe I, maybe I need to find another church because I need to find a church, you know, because even the disciples wondered what was going on, right? Because they were baffled. They said, you know, because Jesus already sent them out two by two and they were delivering and doing, you know, spreading the gospel, you know, about the kingdom of God. They were saying, so they were already going out. Jesus was, went to the mountain. There was a, a wonderful a, a revival service. They came down, boom, 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 and he came into this mess. And so they asked him. So look at the question he says in verse 19 that they asked Jesus privately because they were embarrassed. How many was embarrassing? Yeah. He said, we got to be careful. Because you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we have a word. It's not really a word from God. Mm, right? I've been guilty of that. I thought it was God. You know, God's going to move. God's going to work. God didn't move. God didn't work. God made things work. Things happened. Where, I mean, things got worse. Oops. And so what happened? So they were pretty embarrassed. And they went to him. And said, look, at, look at his response. Jesus responded in verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if, your faith as, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. So it seems that Jesus was saying their faith was too small. But if that was true, why didn't he say you need faith as big as an ocean? Wouldn't that make better sense? I've been on a cruise, right? I love going on a cruise. What I like to do on a cruise, I like to go at nighttime all the way to the top deck. And I like to go all the way to the end, and I like to go out to the ocean. 
And have you ever seen, I mean, this ocean is endless and endless and endless. And it's like, wow, it just shows you how powerful and mighty God, God, my, how mighty God is because you see this wonderful, wonderful ocean. So in all reality, Jesus said, you know, if you need faith, like an ocean, I could say, I understand. Or you need faith as high as the sky. But what was he saying? Instead, he tells them, you need faith the size of a mustard seed. And years ago in church, we gave our mustard seeds. How many remember that? We should do it again, hopefully. Praise the Lord, amen. But I think Sav was the one that put this, but he had to put this, him and his wife, Nancy, put this all together. He did hundreds and hundreds. They ain't doing it no more. But praise the Lord, amen. <laughs> But, but you can buy it on Amazon separately and do it for yourself. All right? Now, you can, how, how many, uh, unless you got an eye of an eagle, you know what I'm saying, you cannot see this mustard seed. So he's saying, all I need is this much faith in order for us to move mountains. And you say, well, I can't even see that. So what is God saying? Because it just seems that before God sort of like contradicts what he said earlier, because he said, look, remember, remember before when he said, you've been unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long should I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Who was Jesus talking to when he said that? Was it the disciples? Messed up again? Was it the, the father? Psst. How much, how, how long do I got to put up with you guys? You guys got to be sick. Like your kids, you say that sometimes. You guys got to be sick. Can't wait till you turn 35 to get out the house. I can't wait. So that's why, you know, and that's why you got to read, when you read an account of the Bible, this is something that you, those of you who are studying the Bible, you have to take both accounts. You have to look what it says in Mark. Let's look at Mark 19, 14. It says, when they came to the, uh, to the other disciples, this is when Jesus came down and met, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So Jesus came down from the mountain of transfiguration. He came with John, with John and James and, and he came into a mess. You know, God, if I was Jesus, I would walk the other way. Oops, I just had a good service. But Jesus went into the mess. And what was the mess? It says the religious leaders. So I guess the disciples were casting out the demon, trying to cast out the demon. Nothing was happening. And the religious leaders weren't there to, to, to base, they were there to hinder Jesus. They were against the work of Jesus. They were there to discredit Jesus. And so basically they were taunting these, they must have been taunting the disciples. Ah, look at your Jesus now. You ain't got no power. Who do you think you are? Jesus is not a God of the Lord, Jesus. And so when he said this perverse generation, he was referring to the people, the teachers and the Pharisees and the, and the people around him. Because every time I read this, I always thought that it was the disciples and it, or it was the man. And so I'm looking at this and I said, well, man, sometimes when I pray, it's Jesus saying that to me, you're unbelieving a perverse person. How long should I stay with you? I don't even want to answer your prayers. Right, because I thought, but see, does this make sense? Does it make sense to you? Yes. See, because see, these Pharisees, Sadducees did not have a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, faith is all about having a relationship with Jesus. The closer you are with Jesus, the more faith you will have. People, it's not a formula. It's not steps that you need to follow. People say, read the Bible, your faith will grow. Yes, but reading the Bible not just builds your faith. How does it build you? Because it gets you closer to Jesus. Praying gets you closer to Jesus. Worshiping gets you closer to Jesus. So everything is rooted in God, rooted in God. Satan doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to think, well, you don't have enough faith, but it's not about the faith faith that within yourself, your own faith, but it's in your relationship with God. And Jesus wants us to the point where we can trust God. His mission is to give us the faith that, that, that we would be able to take the authority that he's given us, that we're not going to allow the devil to distract us. And that's exactly what he was doing. He had the naysayers around him, the demon, maybe the demon possessed kid was acting up and, and suddenly the disciples were frightened and taken back by all of this and it pushed them away from Jesus. And their relationship. 
So suddenly they were like, you know, oh yeah, because sometimes you doubt with, especially when you're doing the reward, how many of you know when you're doing the right thing for Jesus Christ, the naysayers, there's people in church even, there's people around you, there's people in the family, what are you doing? You're doing something wrong. How could you do that? This and this and that. And then the devil starts putting all these thoughts in your, about your past, about your life and all these things. Why should you pray? Why should God answer your prayers? You don't deserve it. But this is what we have to understand. God wants us to be in a position where we have a strong relationship with him, rooted in his word, rooted in his power, rooted in his character. It says, I believe in Jesus. I believe in his word. I believe in his character. I believe in his promises. And we are unshakable because we are taking the authority that he has given us. I'm going to tell you right now, it's more than just praying. We all pray, but he is asking us to pray with authority. What do I mean by that, praying with authority? It's like when, you know, the, the electric company and, and, and so, we, you know, you make, a, you, you, you make a contract with them and, and then you call them up and, and you say, okay, my lights aren't turning on. I want you to come to the house and turn on my lights. My TV's not turning on. And this, this, and they said, but we, the, there's power going in. What's wrong? What's wrong is that we're not putting the power switch. So Jesus Christ has given us all the power. But you take the authority when you put on the power switch and you say, okay, now I believe in God and by faith because I know his character, I know his word, I know his promises. I need to stand on that and take the authority that Jesus has given to you. And as a child of God, he has given us and says, Lord God, I believe that I'm sick, but you said by his stripes we are healed and I'm going to stand on you, Lord God. And I believe that you are supernatural God, that nothing is impossible with you and these mountains that are in your way that are in your path and each and every one of us have a mountain something that's unmovable something that is difficult something that is stretching you down he says speak to that mountain by not just praying but by taking the authority with the muscle seed of faith and saying i speak to that mountain in the name of jesus and i cast it to the sea but you've got to take authority for yourself for yourself that is the connection look what it says in john 15 7 8 if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask anything you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciple. Now this verse is not telling you how to control God. Because a lot of us say, because it's to, in that verse, in John 15, it's all about abiding and having a relationship with Jesus. So in other words, it's staying close. So when you're close to Jesus, you're going to ask him what, you, what he wants. You're going to be sensitive to what he wants. What is God saying about your situation before anything else? When it comes to sickness, what is God saying? So, well, I'm not familiar with his voice. Then you get familiar. How many know not all sickness is going to leave for death? Some sicknesses are for God supernatural to work in your life and do the miraculous. But you got to believe when we find ourselves in situ bad situations or hopeless situations or miserable situations, we can call on God and say, God, I believe in you by faith and I'm going to stand on your word. It says, whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. You're wishing so that what? So that God could be glorified. Jesus wants us to have fruit. What fruit is to be bear evidence of our relationship with him. When people look at him and say, you know what? I had cancer one time, but right now I'm healed by the grace and mercy of God. You know what? My marriage was torn apart. I had my kids were wayward. My, my kids were on drugs. They were on the street. They were in gangs. But I began to pray and I began to believe and I began to take the authority that God has given me. And today they're in church with me. Today my marriage is okay. Today, my finance is okay. Lord God, you should have seen me a couple years ago when I was all jacked up. But right now, I am a child of God. I'm standing on the promises of God. And how many of you have that kind of story in your life? How many of you want that story in your life? I want that to be my story, Lord God. I'm tired of reading it about it in the Bible. I want to live it out. How many of you say amen? You want to live it out? So we see, let's go back to the encounter. And I think this is... What touches me the most in Mark 9, 22, 24, uh, this what the man says. So Jesus goes to the, you know, Jesus uh, is there. He talks to the people and the man brings his son. And he says, it bows down to Jesus. And then he goes on. Let's read Mark 9, 22, 24. It was often, it was often thrown him into the fire, the demon or the water to kill him. This is what I want us to focus on. Pay attention to this. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus replied. 
everything is possible for ones who believe. Immediately, the boy's father explained, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my disbelief, my unbelief. That's me. How many of us can say you find yourself in a situation today you says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Because you've been in church long enough, you, 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 you got some word in you. You got the Bible. The thing is that we believe, and I, I don't know about you, but I believe for other people, but it's hard for me to believe for myself. Amen? Especially when, especially when it's close, close, to the, close to the heart, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 I could pray for your child, but when my child is out there and we haven't seen him in a couple of days and he's bound up in drugs and there's nothing I could do and I'm crying out, Lord God, and I don't want to hear that call, phone, get that phone call that my son or daughter has passed away. Lord God, it's so hard for me to believe. I believe, Lord God, help my unbelief. And so in humility, he admitted, Lord, I cannot do it on my own. He wasn't denying Jesus could heal, but he admitted to God that his faith needed to be awakened. He admitted to God that his faith was weak. See, so if Jesus would have rebuked them, like, you know, we read that rebuke earlier on in the verses, you thought that he would have rebuked them again. But no, lovingly, caringly, Jesus goes and offers him. Jesus doesn't condemn this man of unbelief. Instead, he offers help and healing he had to, but the man had to do one thing. He had to place his small faith in a big God. Once again, it's not the size of your faith that gets your prayers answered, but the what? The size of your God. The size of your God. So today as I close, I wonder how many of us are struggling with our faith. You find yourself in a situation at this moment, you says, Lord God, I need my faith to be awakened. Lord, I believe. I believe you're good. I believe you can. But there's a part of me, Lord God, this has been going on for a long time like this man. It's been a couple years. I haven't seen any changes. Lord God, it just seems that I'm always, Lord God, uh, apprehensive or, or I'm, I'm anxious and worried. And then I'm, I'm allowing fear to, to put some distance between us, Lord God. I'm reading your Bible, but I'm no longer believing. And I'm praying, but I'm no longer believing. And I'm fasting 21 days, but I'm no longer believing that at the end of this 21 days, I'm going to see the miraculous hand of God. I'm doing all the right things, but Lord God, help my unbelief. Because that's where I find myself today. Do you believe God is bigger than your problems, your doubts, and your fears? It's not the size of your faith that gets your prayers answered, but what? The size of your God. So are you ready? Are you ready for your faith to be awakened? We find ourselves in difficult situations. It's true. But we serve a God who's more than able. And what is he waiting for you? Well, I don't have enough faith. Remember, God gives us the faith, like I said before. And all you need is a mustard seed of faith. And this little seed can move a mountain. What mountain are you facing today? What mountain needs to be removed? Is it a mountain of addiction? Whatever it is, I can go on and on and on, but I don't want to at this moment. But I believe, and how many believe that God wants to awaken your faith? How many of you need your faith to be awakened by simply saying, Lord God, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let us pray at this moment. Lord God, we just lift up.